Well, welcome everybody to this month's version of Metro Monday. Uh, thanks to our Silver Line Committee, we've uh, been uh, doing some yeoman type work to put uh, today's event together. So uh, I just wanted to uh, say a quick hello to everyone. Uh, those of you I have not met before, I am the interim president and CEO of your Dulles Regional Chamber. So it's my great pleasure to kick things off this morning or this afternoon. Uh, and we've got some great panelists uh, that are going to be uh, providing some very insightful information. So uh, with that, it's my great pleasure to turn this over to the chairman of the Silver Line Committee and Metro Mondays, Ms. Georgia Graves. Well, thank you. However, I'm the co-chair. Co <laughs> right. That's okay. I chaired it for a number of years, but I'm very, very proud to co-chair the Silver Line Committee Metro Monday with Joe Ritchie. Uh, to get started, first of all, all the speakers, thank you sincerely for your efforts and for being part of this most important discussion today. I'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our co-sponsor for this event, who made this uh, event possible, Tyson's Partnership. And I would like to thank our annual premier sponsor, Transwestern. Additionally, there are chamber sponsors to mention, and those are Eldon Street Financial, Main Street Bank, Northwest Federal Credit Union, Thompson Greenspawn, and our media coverage sponsor, Fairfax Public Access Channel 10, who will record this, put it on their TV, on their TV channel, Channel 10, and then it will go on their FPA YouTube channel where you can see it uh, in the near future. Um, it also gives me a uh, privilege to introduce um, the, the people that make up the Silver Line Committee, which is the backbone of this organization. And we, I'm very proud to introduce Scott York, the executive director of the Committee for Dulles Pass, the president of York Consulting Group and the former chairman of the board of Loudoun County uh, Board of Supervisors. Dennis Holstey, the economic development manager for the town of Herndon. Dusty Smith, media relations for Dulles Quarter Metro Rail Project. Chris Hunter, the business retention manager for the Department of Economic Development in Loudoun County. Joe Ritchie, the executive vice president of Transwestern. Al Hansen, Director of Architecture for DBI Architects. Of course, Joe Martin, our interim president, and myself, Georgia Graves, president of Bridgman Communications. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator, and I'd like to thank the president of Tyson's Partnership, Saul, Gla Saul, Saul Glassman, for sharing Ronit Dances with us and allowing her to be our moderator for today's event. She has put a countless hours into making this a very successful turnout. And I'm sure you will be uh, pleased with what you'll hear because we need your support and help. Uh, Ronit is the Director of Transportation Management Association of Tyson's Partnership. She directs and drives the Tyson's Partnership's Transportation and Mobility Work, catalyzing the trans. Uh, transformation of Tyson's into a walkable, bikeable, and transit-based city. She has served on the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government's Transportation Planning Board Citizens Advisory Committee since 2016. Before coming to Tyson's as the TMA director, she led the successful efforts to build the Purple Line in suburban Maryland. Now I'd like to introduce and turn it over to Ronit Dances. Ronit. Thank you very much, Georgia. And can I just say what a pleasure it is for the Tyson's partnership to work with the Dulles Chamber on and fulfill really the vision of the Silver Line to some extent, which is connecting all of us together. And a, a, regional, a, a regional transit, a, a, region, a regional line, um, a core line for economic development and business growth. Um, so we're very, very excited to be here today. And um, we've been just, we are, I guess we sort of see ourselves as sort of we're phase one and we have been waiting for phase two almost as anxiously as you. So we're very fine, we're glad to sort of join forces here. I have the great pleasure to introduce a very distinguished panel. Um, the first, uh, first up is Marsha McAllister, who I think that this audience does not need an introduction, but Marsha is of course the communication manager for Dulles Rail Project, and she's been at this for 16 years, um, representing the Metropolitan Washington Air Airports Authority, and I'm also very proud to say she's a Tyson's resident. 
um, moving right along, um, we are very pleased to be able to introduce, to have Supervisor Letourneau with us. He represents the Dell. He's been representing the Dallas District on the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors since 2011. He serves as Chairman of the Board's Finance, Government Operations, and Economic Development Community Committee. He also represents Loudoun on the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, which oversees public transit. Supervisor Letourneau is also the first Loudoun County Supervisor to serve on the Metro Board of Directors and represents Virginia as a Principal Director. In 2018, he was Chairman of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government's Board of Directors. I'm also very, we're also very lucky to have Supervisor Alcorn. Supervisor Alcorn represents the Hunter Mill District uh, the, to the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, which we're, and we're lucky in Tyson's because about 10% of Tyson's gets to be in that district. Um, supervisor also serves as an alter, a principal alternate representing Virginia on the WMATA board. So between both of these supervisors, we've got really great coverage of the WMATA board. And I apologize, WMATA is short, for, is, is a fancy word for saying Metro. Um, I've, so we're gonna try and we're gonna try and stay away from some of the jargon today, but sometimes it sneaks in. Supervisor Alcorn was on the planning commission for 16 years and then also served two years on the Park Authority Board, and he's played a key role in transportation, environmental, environmentalism, and also helping plan Tyson. So we're thrilled to have him. Um, I'm going to move on to my boss, Saul Glasner, president and CEO of the Tyson's Partnership. He's been associated with the Tyson's Partnership from its inception and served as chairman of its board of directors from 2012 to 2014. Saul served for 22 years as general counsel of the MITRE Corporation, a systems engineering firm with a large corporate presence in Tyson's and a founding member of the Tyson's Partnership. And Saul is an enthusiastic train rider and transit taker and also a cyclist. <laughs> and then we also have with us today, Joe McAndrew, who is the Vice President of Transportation at the Greater Washington Partnership. For those of you who may, who may know the organization, the Greater Washington Partnership is a civic alliance of the region's leading employers and entrepreneurs committing to make it, committed to making the capital region from Baltimore to Richmond, one of the area's best places, excuse me, one of the world's best places to live, work and build a business. And for those, again, that's Baltimore to Richmond and that absolutely includes Mall of the Silver Line and all of us, all of us here today. Joe de develops, directs and drives all activity relating to the partnership's efforts to achieve a regional 21st century transportation ecosystem. He previously worked as a legislative assistant in the US Senate and was a policy director of transportation for America. Joe holds a master's in community and regional planning from the University of Oregon. And with, with that, um, I think we are going to, we are going to start just, just so that you guys have the, um, the idea of the structure of this, as, ever, as, as, hope, as, as we all know, there's a difference between capital and operations. And we're gonna start off with capital, which I think from the phase two, from, from sort of phase two is generally has been capital. Those of us in phase one have also have to get to have the privilege so far of operations and we're looking forward to phase two joining that as well. So we will start off with capital with an update from Marsha on where things are. And then we will move into operations, which, which is gonna be, which is a little bit more complicated and which we've got a lot to talk about. So Marsha, please take it away. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. It's nice to be with you. And yes, I'm in Tyson's Corner. I've lived in Tyson's, which no longer has the corner on it, as we know, for 35 years. And so I've seen a dramatic amount of change in this area. Um, but now I'm going to, I'd like to update you on where the Silver Line Phase 2 is. At this point in time, construction is 99% complete. All the stations are done, all the pedestrian bridges are done, all the entrance pavilions are done there. But at this point, we are about to move into, we're moving into systems and getting the systems all connected. And that's our focus heavily, heavily into, ties, into systems testing and also into commissioning efforts and working on a daily basis with WMATA to make that happen. I'd like to, pause for a minute and defer from our construction and give you an update on COVID and the project since a lot of that's the topic of this of, of this session. COVID has had a has very little effect on our construction. As you know, construction workers were allowed to continue to work and they did work and our contractors have put in extra hours to make up any time that they may have met when they have had cases of COVID. We have to say that the first seven months of COVID was really well. In the last several weeks, we've had 
we have had more cases being reported and uh, both within our organization and with Ma and in with WMATA, who is essential to our testing at this point. Our goal at this point, and that's fresh from a meeting about 20 minutes ago, is to turn it over to the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority sometime in spring. I emphasize late spring though, and the coordination efforts to make that happen are going on, as I said, daily and sometimes hourly every day with WMATA. There are some challenges. We have discovered some, some problems uh, as we moved into testing. Um, I can say that our contractors, Capital Rail Constructors and Pencil Phelps, uh, a Northern Virginia-based contractor also, have, uh, have worked as hard as I think they possibly can to cooperate with us to get everything done. But the things that have been revealed to us by both WMATA inspectors, by our own internal inspectors throughout time, and recently by some outside agencies, we are on top of all of those problems. And we, are on, we really feel like those challenges are being met. The many of you heard about the universal concrete um, problems and the track problems. Both of those are to the point this point have been repaired to this point in time where we're working with Met, with WMATA to escrow funds for any future problems that might be taking place in those two arenas. All of that will be funded by the contractors, not by the airport, not by toll road users. Um, you know, when you think of this project, it's a $6.2 billion project. And to have things come up like that we have had, it's not unusual at all if you look across the nation at this, what happens when you get to the finishing touches of a project. You see all the systems working together where the systems previously had been independently tested. The big tests are now taking place now when you're connecting it all up and also connecting it all up with the existing phase one. The phase one tie-ins at Wheelie Avenue have been underway for about two and a half months now. We're, um, we've had several shutdowns on weekends, which has limited some service to some of the areas. We are going to need one more and perhaps two more short weekend shutdowns, maybe two days rather than three like the others, but we're working with WMATA to make sure those take place to inch where we can make sure that we finish everything that needs to be done, where they can move forward as soon as they're ready to open. And as always, people ask us who's, when we're gonna open, and that has always been WMATA's decision, but we're working together to get the service up as soon as possible to serve the entire region. The, uh, I think we've lost the PowerPoint. So at this point, you would be looking at pictures, if we were into it, of the final completion work going on inside the tie-in area at the uh, uh, Wheelie Rest in the East Station area. And I hope some of you can take a look at it and see that picture somewhere else along the line. Um, as I said, we are confident that we're working together to finish in time for WMATA to do their testing. Um, and open this summer if that is possible, depending upon all the different issues that face WMATA these days with uh, COVID issues and the lack of ridership. The, uh, we are very, very confident at this point, like I hope everybody else, on, I'm sure everybody else online with me now is, are very confident that the future economic impacts, the land use decisions that have been made or in the bank, so to speak, to be a major part of future growth, uh, commercially, residentially, and retail all along phase two. Um, may not come quite as fast for phase two as it did for phase one, but it will come and we're going to be partners with everybody doing that. We're also going to be pushing for people to build, to build and maintain ridership. Um, we know that people aren't gonna go out and leap onto a train these days without knowing they're safe. WMATA has done an awful lot to make that happen for you. And I know you're going to hear more about that. In closing, I'd like to um, con see, dissuade you on a rumor that has floated. There have been several questions and rumors regarding where, where our funding is affected and was it a fund, fund, uh, affected by COVID, et cetera, et cetera. 
No, our funding is completely intact. There's been no change in the allocation of funds. In fact, we have already spent all of the phase one money that came from the federal government to fund this project. Uh, uh, so that part is set in gold and stone. And I included in this presentation some charts I'm going to have to refer to for just a minute. But I sent you and provided you, and I hope you, we can find a way to post it afterwards where you can find it, is the allocation of all the funds that have been used to build a project at some point. I would like to correct myself just a little bit. There were a few federal assisted dollars in phase two. Those were all low interest federal loans. We have, the airports authority has already paid off those loans. And so at this point, we're dependent totally upon the localities and the tax special tax districts. Thanks to everybody in the special tax district. I know many of you districts are probably listening in and money has been greatly appreciated. And there's some funds from the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, most of which are restricted for use at the innovation station. But there's um, state funds and aviation funds from the airport and of course the tolls from the Dulles Toll Road. There they are, there are those things. But I'll be around at the end after everybody finishes to answer any questions or if anyone, so any, keep, you can funnel your questions straight in. Thank you very, very much and it's a delight to be here. Thank you so much, Marsha. And just to clarify, Mar Marsha, you're talking about capital funding. That's construction funding. We are now- That is construction to funding. We have no operations money in our budget. We- uh, Absolutely. Because uh, you don't operate these. This is our <laughs> capital funding, but feel free to uh, use that information in those charts if you have any, if any of you have questions regarding that. Absolutely. So we are now Thank going to- you. Thank you so much, Marsha, and thanks for the photos. Um, so we are now going to, and Marsha, just one question I'd like to clarify. You, I believe, if, am I correct that, M, that the, the construction authority, which is the airport's authority, will is currently expecting to turn, to turn phase two over to WMATA, AKA Metro, in the late spring? Is, did I hear that correct? Late, late spring, late, okay. late spring, and- uh, Right. And then they have their own testing pr procedures. And then they do, they have not, they have 90 days after we turn it over to get it up and running. But in mm -hmm. this, uh, as we have all learned from building this project, that sometimes things may take a little bit longer. Yes. Yeah. No, I just didn't want somebody to start, you know, banging on the doors, you know, the first, no, no. The first day of and June, wondering why the train wasn't running. Um. <laughs> no. <laughs> Those calls will come to me. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they will. <laughs> Send them to me. Okay. So we are now going to. Thank you. So we're now going to move on to Supervisor Liter Supervisor Letourneau. and yes, we are now in the more difficult phase of operations funding, which has been which has been seriously affected by COVID. Um, and Supervisor Letourneau, um, if um, we'll cover just just for those of those of you who may not be familiar with Metro's uh, fiscal year. Um, just to make life a little bit more interesting, it is not run with the calendar year. We are currently in fiscal year 21, which ends, and please Supervisor Letourneau, correct me if I'm wrong, that ends June 30th of this year, and then fiscal year, fiscal, fiscal year 22 begins on July 1. And so there's a great, so there's, been, and there have been some, any number, I know there's been a great deal of news. There have also been some pretty dramatic changes in just the last month. So thank you so much, Supervisor Letourneau. Yes, so uh, today I'm talking primarily in my capacity as a member of the Metro Board. For those that aren't familiar, there's eight of us that are principal directors and eight that are alternate directors. Um, Supervisor Alcorn's actually my alternate. So Virginia has two members. I am the appointee of the local jurisdictions through MVTC and Paul Smedberg is the governor's appointee. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Um, if you haven't seen me in a while, you'll notice I am down an eye from a injury I had in September. Uh, very serious uh, uh, injury coaching a baseball team, and I still recover, recovering from that. Unfortunately, have not regained the vision yet, so probably some more surgery in my future. But uh, in any event, let's go ahead and go on to the next uh, slide. So as you said, uh, there's operating, there's capital, and just to make it even, even a greater distinction, the construction budget for the Metro project 
is its own budget completely. Uh, it's not related to Metro's capital budget either. Um, it's a budget that I am familiar with as a Loudoun County supervisor because we contributed to it through the um, tax districts that were mentioned um, and direct uh, directly, but it is not related to Metro's capital budget. Um, as it relates to Metro itself and our status, um, we did receive good news with the federal COVID relief package that was passed um, as part of the omnibus uh, bill. The overall region is going to be receiving about $830 million. About 720 of that is going to Metro. Um, $108 million will be going from Metro to local providers per sort of a standard agreement. Um, and that leaves us with about $600 million. $600 million is, is great. Um, that will allow us to essentially balance the FY21 budget uh, with about 95 million of that. We had planned some, some fairly significant, but not necessarily painful cuts coming in February that we're going to be avoiding. And then we're using the remainder, about 515 million to help balance the FY22 budget. Uh, now, like uh, all the jurisdictions, uh, we have a budget process. The process is just beginning, which is why uh, it's good timing for us to be meeting like this. Uh, Metro will be passing a budget probably in the mid-March to early April timeframe, similar to what the counties do for their own budgets in anticipation of that July um, timeframe. If we go on to the next slide, uh, this is the next slide is the bad news slide. So that, although that's a lot of money, that is not enough money to cover the full revenue shortfall that Metro is receiving. So if you think about Metro for a minute, we don't receive any operating assistance from the federal government, only capital through PREA. Um, we're entirely funded by contributions. In Virginia, we're funded by the local jurisdiction contributions and the state. Maryland, the state takes care of the whole thing, which is very nice for those jurisdictions. Um, and of course, the district pays for its share. There's a formula that decides uh, how that's going. So that's sort of the subsidy side. The other piece of the metro budget is the revenue side. Uh, most of our revenue comes from rail. Uh, rail has a much higher rate of recovery than bus service does. And so uh, when rail ridership plummeted, as it has, uh, Metro saw essentially a, a massive uh, uh, decrease in overall revenue, and that creates this budget hole. Uh, we were able to plug a lot of the budget hole this year with the first round of CARES Act money, and now the discussion is how to do that for fiscal year 22. Uh, there's uh, essentially a, a sort of a, a philosophical debate that the board's going to have, which is, do we apply um, all of the funds uh, and try to avoid layoffs, or do we spread it out over a longer period of time into the second half of the year? And there's really two schools of thought about this. Um, we can get into what the congressional intent was. We can get into how other industries handle it. There's a lot of people here who are familiar with the aviation industry and the airline industry. They're taking all their money and they're applying it. So they're calling people back to work. They're not, you know, they're, they're not laying people off to the extent that they that would have been. Um, for Metro, if we do that and we apply the money and we keep us essentially at about an 80% rate in terms of what, what sort of service we're providing, uh, we will run out of money in, in January. And then that will create a, a new shortfall that has to be filled. Uh, it would result in us laying off about 2,500 people at that time. Um, we would have to close down stations, uh, similar to sort of the doomsday budget scenario that we had initially shared if we hadn't received federal funding. Um, and we would essentially uh, be in that position of having to take more grave sort of, uh, for, sort of measures. Now, importantly, as it relates to Silver Line Phase 2, the Metro Board has not done anything to delay the opening of Phase 2 as a matter of uh, Metro policy or budget policy. Um, thus far, the position of the Metro Board has been whenever the, the project is been turned over, um, and deemed acceptable and safe and gone through testing, we should open it. Um, and that's certainly my position. That's the position of the Virginia members. That's the position of the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. And it's also the general manager's position, I should add. Um, so all of our budget assumptions to this point assume a July 1 operating date. Now, I'm not gonna go back into the discussion on the rail project. There are issues as you heard about. I'm a member of the Metro Safety and Operations Committee. Uh, there was a meeting in December where we outlined those and it was suggested at that meeting that uh, because of the amount of time it's gonna take to resolve some of these things, July 1 is probably not realistic. Um, and certainly if those, those that are interested, that was a public meeting with the public PowerPoint that we could share. Uh, but nevertheless, whenever that happens, um, then Metro would be in a position to open it. Uh, that is our position. Going to the next slide, which is about public input, 
that may not necessarily be the position of everyone on the Metro board. And this is where it's important for us to have this discussion. So um, whenever that case is that we start, uh, start with operations, um, it will have a significant cost in terms of operating budget and it will increase the subsidy for the jurisdictions. They have to pay more essentially to operate it. We're already incurring some of those startup costs right now. Um, and, and so, and, and every jurisdiction has been paying those, uh, despite the fact that it hasn't started. Um, the question on top of that now, there's an equity analysis that has to take place through Title VI. Um, and what that means is uh, essentially when Silverline Phase II service starts, um, Metro is going to have to provide additional support elsewhere in the system for low income and minority riders. Um, and so there's a placeholder in the FY22 budget for about $20 million, which is the amount that uh, initial estimates believe could be needed to make up for that Title VI issue that we have um, in the budget. So when you look at those costs, the startup costs, uh, the operating costs increases in the subsidy plus the equity, um, and then you look at sort of the budget hole we would have in January, it has led to some discussion about, well, does it make sense for us to open up phase two um, in light of these challenges and light of low ridership and so on. Um, my answer to that is yes, it does. Because uh, if we are trying to recover, um, if we want to be part of that recovery, we know that the highest growth part of the system is the Silver Line. It is the Dulles Corridor. We have many, many years of land use decisions that Fairfax and Loudoun County have made. We have employers who have moved in and are banking on having Metro. We have, uh, even in the case of a federal agency, we have employees moving in in the next six months uh, to space that would be Metro accessible as part of phase two. Um, and so we believe that it is, uh, but there will be a public process as there always is to provide input to the Metro board on these sorts of issues. And this will be one of those issues that I think it would be definitely appropriate to hear from the public, from the business community, from organizations about. Um, as you can see on the slide, that, that participation period will begin in February. There'll be hearings in March. And then of course the board will, will, will make its final decisions. Um, now, when I talked about that sort of uh, philosophical uh, discussion about um, you know, whether you kind of use and apply all the money until it runs out or whether you try to save it and incur uh, layoffs and some, some more marginal uh, service reductions, um, one of those big questions is, is there more, is there more help coming from the federal government? You know, is there going to be more of an aid package? Um, if you go to that next slide, final slide, um, which is sort of touching on that a little bit, um, you know, the new president recently talked about a new aid package that would have a significant amount of money in it for transit. If something like that were to come through, then we're not looking at that sort of budget cliff again in January. And so we need the continued pressure on the federal government to include transit and in any future package. Um, now in the last package, uh, state and local governments were not included, although there was some targeted help for vaccine distribution and such. Um, so we know that that's probably gonna be a priority in the future package, uh, but transit did receive um, a, a significant amount of money. It wasn't as much money as we got the first round in CARES Act. But if we are to continue service, um, and be part of that recovery. And hopefully by January next year, uh, there will be quite a bit of recovery going on and most of us will have vac be vaccinated and, and be ready to go back to work, um, then we're gonna need some additional federal help. And so it certainly would be helpful to have that continued discussions with our elected leaders. I wanna say that our, our congressional delegation here in Northern Virginia and in Maryland, um, and, and Delegate uh, Norton in DC have been very, very supportive of, of everything and we're advocates for, for funding for transit. So it's not so much them that we need to speak to, but we do need to let them know that Metro will be once again in this position if this is the uh, decision that the board makes. You know, we, we do believe that some of congressional intent was for us to avoid layoffs and that would mean applying uh, the funding uh, you know, to, to both close the, the 21 gap and also to keep us at sort of an 80% service level um, in 22. Um, and then, like I said, of course, continued to uh, uh, dialogue about phase two. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention, which will be an issue as we discuss this budget, is how much uh, to sort of dip into our capital budget um, in order to cover uh, operating shortfalls. And that has been something that's been suggested by some board members. Um, it was part of an initial discussion with staff. I've pushed back on that very, very strongly because 
Uh, over a period of decades, Metro has made some decisions like that. And I think that's led to the state of repair that we were in. And we are now on the other side of that. We got um, dedicated funding from uh, Richmond to help and, and from the other jurisdictions to help us uh, uh, with a state of good repair. Um, so we gotta be very protective of, of how we're spending that. And we need to make sure that we're still funding our capital budget um, and we're using our debt service very wisely. Um, I'm the chairman of our finance committee in Loudoun County. We wouldn't do something like this. And so we wanna make sure that um, it's not a quick and easy fix for the board to simply dip into those funds and try to cover some of this operating subsidy because I think in the long run that will hurt the system. So that's kind of what I'll mention for now, but I'll be happy to uh, take some questions later on uh, when we get to that point. Thank you, Thank you very much, Supervisor Letourneau. Um, the, the, um, just, and I think just to underline our key point here, this, the proposed cuts that would take place in January 22, including mo many Silver Line stations, this is not a done deal. Absolutely not. Um, and in fact, I would go as far as to say that for me personally as a board member, if, um, if we believe that that really will happen in January, that there is no relief coming, then I would probably advocate a different path in terms of how we apply this federal funding to try to smooth that out a little bit. Um, but it is not a done deal. I think it, it, it will depend, you know, we will have more intelligence between now and April in terms of what the federal response is likely to be, what the administration will propose, how Congress reacts to it. So we're going to need all of that information to help us kind of decide how much of that money to apply, whether we should have some service reductions in July to avoid that scenario, or whether we're sort of safe to apply our funding, avoid layoffs, avoid further reductions in service. Um, but, you know, then have that risk for, for January, but it's not a done deal. Okay, that's, thank you. And, but it's not a done deal, but neither is, federal funding isn't guaranteed either unless it we, not. Uh, it, all right. And, it, and yes, we've got fantastic delegations throughout the region, but the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Am I correct? <laughs> yes, uh, you know, it, it certainly does not hurt to bring this up in every conversation and make sure that even our delegation knows that it has continued to be a, a major priority because they've said, look, we've gotten you guys money. You know, uh, you've gotten two two tranches of this, uh, but unfortunately, it's an expensive system to to operate and maintain, um, and it really falls on the local governments, in particular, to do it. All of whom are experiencing, to varying degrees, their own issues. You know, especially those jurisdictions that are closer in, like my you know, colleagues in Arlington and Alexandria, they're dealing with quite a bit of decreased tourism, hotel tax, meals tax. All those things are way down. Um, you know, but even in Loudoun, our commercial uh, uh, portfolio is taking a hit. So, um, you know, local governments will have less money and may be asked to do more without federal assistance. Thank you very much, Supervisor Letourneau. And now Supervisor Alcorn. Thank you, Renee. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you, Georgia. And thank you, Joe, as well, for inviting me today. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Matt, for serving as the principal uh, on the WMATA board. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm the Hunter Mill District Supervisor on the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. So I'll be speaking today uh, mostly as the Fairfax County uh, board member, uh, not as the alternate board member to uh, the Metro board. So um, after thanking all those folks, I do wanna thank uh, many of the people listening to this presentation today. Um, many of you are landowners that are in tax districts that are actually paying for uh, the silver line for the capital costs, um, as well as anybody who's driving on the toll road. So I should thank them as well. Uh, but for those of you that are, 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 have made the financial commitment to bring rail to Dulles and beyond, uh, thank you very much for doing that. I, I would note that uh, it is, it is uh, a different part of the regional Metro system uh, the silver line in terms of how it was paid for. Uh, I think it does mean that there is extra special interest by many of you in making sure that the silver line um, actually is put into operation as soon as possible, and frankly, that it works. And that that is a good thing. Uh, that is something Fairfax County uh, most heartily supports. And I also note that uh, Fairfax County for most of the last couple of decades has built uh, most of its growth plans around Metro, Metro Rail, and uh, especially in the Dulles Corridor with Tyson's and uh, Reston um, as well. So um, Fairfax County has a big stake in making sure this works. 
and appreciate very much everything that the folks uh, uh, on this call are doing to make sure that happens. Um, I do want to go back to something uh, uh, Matt mentioned, the other principal board member for WMATA from Virginia, and, and that's Paul Smetberg. Paul is also the chair of the Metro Board right now. Um, I want to quote Paul uh, because I've heard him saying this a few times, and maybe he's been saying it before, and I just didn't hear it. Um, but rail in the metro system, rail pays the bills. And I think it's really important in going into this budget process, and also as, as those of you listening uh, are considering submitting public testimony or talking to elected officials or metro uh, board members or participating in that process, it's important to keep that in mind, that it's really the rail riders that have funded much of the metro system, uh, the operation side of the metro system and, and does keep it viable. Now, as a Fairfax County board member, I'm also very aware of the you know, $150 million plus we pay every year as a subsidy to Metro. But the, the hole that we're dealing with right now is the pandemic induced uh, ridership loss from rail. So I think that's important because as we think about the Metro budget and going forward, we have to keep in mind that the long-term financial viability of Metro depends on people using rail. So uh, that's why it's so important for WMATA uh, to open phase two uh, as soon as it's ready and as soon as it's practicable. And Marsha, thank you for your presentation. Please, please relate um, our collective sense of urgency in finishing the project. Um, thank you very much for all the work that you've done. Uh, but that project does need to get done and turned over uh, with all the uh, financial um, uh, requirements associated with it locked down. So uh, I think that's one thing to take in, into consideration is that uh, as you think about communicating on the Metro budget, remember that rail pays the bills. The other piece, and this, is, this gets to the, the question and I guess the philosophy of the WMATA budget in FY22, uh, you know, right now there's, there's under consideration opening phase two and then a few months later closing down some of the phase two rail stations. Well, <laughs> you know, if, if our strategy here is is regional recovery, then let's make sure that our regional infrastructure is operational. And that has to start uh, after the opening of the Silver Line, that has at Silver Line phase two, that has to include um, all the stations of the Silver Line uh, being operational. So I, I do strongly encourage um, all of you to communicate in the WMATA budget process uh, please do talk to your federal representatives, as Matt uh, described as well. But um, these decisions, uh, I, I think, will have a big impact on whether or not we do get ridership, uh, how fast we get ridership back uh, onto Metro Rail, and ultimately the, the longer term um, stability financially of, of the Silver Line and the overall Metro system. So. Thank you again for paying attention to this. Thank you for pitching in. And, and the last thing that I'll note, and they're just early discussions about this. I know WMATA has some plans, but we're a few months away from really going all out to make sure that people know that Metro Rail is safe, uh, that Metro Rail is functioning, and it's time to get back on the rails. So in, in, in pushing forward with that agenda, in that message, uh, I expect we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of partners. Uh, you know, it's not it can't just be WMATA. Uh, it 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 needs to be the local jurisdictions, the Commonwealth, and many of your organizations and companies uh, in partnership to actually get folks uh, back on the rails uh, when people are getting back into their offices. Let's make sure they start with the right habits and and use Metro Rail and take advantage of this tremendously valuable asset uh, that is coming online throughout the whole Dulles quarter. So uh, thank you again, and, and I'll be here if uh, there's additional discussion or questions. 
Thank you so much, Supervisor Alcorn. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is something like 70% of Metro's operating budget traditionally comes from rail riders. Is that, is that correct? Well, it actually about 50% of, um, of the cost of rail comes from the fare box. Okay. And for, for Metro bus, it's, it's much lower. Um, so, uh, Matt, I don't know how you have anything else you want to add on that, but, uh, no, I don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you're right. The, the, the cost recovery on bus is much, much lower. It's mm -hmm. roughly about half on rail. It depends to your question about how much, what the subsidy piece is and all that. But the bottom line is, you know, rail is, is the one that, you know, provides most of the revenue that we need. Right. And just, I'm going to ask a question that I, I hate asking, but just to underline Walter's point here. What has since the pandemic? Um, what has been the drop in rail ridership? So rail ridership now um, hovers between ten and fifteen percent of what it was. So it's about an over eighty percent drop. Bus ridership, however, is is sitting at about fifty to sixty percent. Um, and I think if you look at sort of who's working and who needs to go to work now. Um, that starts to make some sense when you think about that. And that's why, you know, uh, we don't want to de-emphasize bus. It's very, very important. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's not something, you know, we, we want to expand, not, not contract. But I think the point is to try to do that on the back of rail doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Understood. Thank you. And Supervisor Alcorn, we could not agree more that th getting everybody back on rail it will be a, this will be a, you know, we, we might be facing another roaring 20s. And if people are going out there to, to party and to dance the Charleston or, you know, drink gin or something, we want them doing it on rail or on bus rather than in some other fashion. Yeah, but um, not on the rail cars. Okay, please. Let's, okay. Not on the trains. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. No, thank you. Thank, Rita, you, for that, thank, you for that, thank you for that clarification. Um, we have heard a great deal about the role of the federal government and the role of the regional of our congressional delegation in Virginia and DC and in Maryland in terms of getting us the money. And Joe McAndrew at the, at the Greater Washington Partnership is going to give us sort of a, a greater, a big view of that. So thank you, Joe. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Verneet and, and to everybody for having me here today. I, I, um, Get the lucky opportunity uh, under uh, before times to travel from Baltimore to Richmond, oftentimes by rail uh, and other modes. Um, so uh, it's a, a different time these days. But um, you know, the Greater Washington Partnership works with some of the larger larger employers, some of which are, are present here today uh, from Baltimore to Richmond. And I think one of the big things that we heard uh, as soon as the lockdowns took place in March was. Um, we need to have uh, a confidence, a high level of confidence that our transit system is safe and reliable uh, for employees to be able to access it. We also need it to be there when we're ready to return. Um, I think, you know, uh, a little bit of the conversation that just happened, we recognize that, that while rail uh, might not be uh, as, as used today, uh, it's going to be critically essential uh, for our region once the vaccines are in the arms and we hit herd immunity, knock on wood, hopefully this summer, and we can come back out of our, our caves and see each other <laughs> in person for this conversation next go. But, you know, um, until then, the bus is the workhorse of the transit system. It has been uh, previously, and it's making sure that our frontline workers are able to get, get to job sites to put those vaccines in our arms, to uh, make it... Uh, uh, to their healthcare appointments and such. So I think, you know, my, my big takeaway, my big message, and then I'll go into a little bit more, is that um, transit uh, was essential before, but it's going to be essential for our economy to recover in a strong, uh, successful way. It's going to take the collective region working together uh, to do so. I'm going to go ahead and just flick up uh, my screen real quick for folks uh, uh, to see... Um, a few items that we've been working on at the Greater Washington Partnership. And then I wanna close it out with a few priorities uh, for, um, uh, for the uh, federal conversation where I think the, the major focus of our attention needs to be as a collective region. Can you guys see the screen here? Uh, the capital COVID-19 snapshot? Perfect. We did this in partnership uh, with the folks on the phone here. so. Uh, at the end of the day, um, again, stepping back to when, when the uh, COVID hit uh, and, and we 
we went into lockdown, we wanted to try to figure out how to help the region understand the signals, both when the employers are, are, are bringing folks back to work sites, as well as when uh, informing the public sector conversation. So we work with a slew of regional partners that you can see here uh, to uh, conduct employer surveys and then also access data sets that are, I think, going to be important. I just want to call your attention to it uh, in the, in the um, coming months as, as we look to reopen. But um, we released a fresh set of, of data in, in early January, right before, uh, right after the insurrection, uh, right before the inauguration. So it's okay if you missed it. I'll go ahead and highlight it real quickly. But uh, what it was, was uh, our second uh, set of employer surveys uh, with over 180 employers uh, responding from Baltimore to Richmond. Um, and, and here are some of the key findings. First and foremost, we as a region relative to many others throughout the country have a high share of our workforce that are remote capable, uh, just in terms of job category type. And so a higher share of our workforce is currently remote and likely will remain that way uh, until things like vaccines, schools, uh, and employee sentiment, safety, uh, perception, changes likely uh, around the time that the vaccines in the schools open up before we see a large return uh, to the work site. Um, big shocker there. Um, since August, uncertainty was the name. I think uncertainty is, is uh, waning a little bit. We're seeing more and more folks understand when reopening will happen but they pushed back the expectation of when they were gonna reopen their work sites. Uh, uh, last uh, August, when we, filled up, or we had folks fill out the survey, uh, they were expecting to return a majority of the workforce this summer. Uh, now a majority of the workforce is assuming that they're gonna be on site this fall. Uh, and that I think tracks with other national surveys as well. Um, <laughs> I think some of the other items that are, are, are really interesting, and I'll get into some transit specific items here in a second. Uh, workforce, uh, or sorry, remote work is gonna go up, but uh, full-time telework, at least the respondents on this uh, round of the survey didn't expect that the large share were gonna go five days a week full-time telework in the future. That said, more than 50% of the respondents expect that their employees are gonna have uh, telework options one to two days a week. It's gonna change the dynamic of our, of our office space throughout the entire region and how folks get there. Um, I think one other item that's really important is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions and I don't think that this is firmed up yet, but uh, most employers uh, are not yet planning to change their footprint in terms of their office footprint. 75% um, of all of the respondents didn't say they were planning to change it. That said, um, uh, a higher share of those employers with 100 employees or more uh, were responding. About 30% of those folks are looking uh, at potentially shifting uh, their work, workspace needs. Uh, at this website, we can share it later. Uh, you've also got the transit tracker and a back to work barometer that we update every two weeks uh, with transit data, both from WMATA and regional partners. Um, we talk about crowding and, and usage, and I think that this is really important. Uh, you can go all the way down to the station level here um, and look at a time of day uh, or, or a range or a period. So for example, uh, 1-6, uh, January 6th, we'll live in infamy, uh, but there was a higher rate of, of transit ridership. And you can go look at the station you start at, say if you start at, at Fort Totten uh, and the station you end at, um, and you can see uh, that at the end of the day, the stations and the ridership levels by and large are not yet hitting uh, at the COVID uh, approved uh, ridership level. So uh, what we have is a access capacity. Uh, folks should hopefully feel comfortable uh, coming back to rail, uh, coming back to the bus as well. But uh, this information is here. We're going to continue to update it this year. Please feel free to, to access it, utilize it. Uh, ask questions. Uh, also in here, uh, we've got bus level data, uh, different levels of, of AM, PM, peak, um, and, and different types of reopening. Finally, and I, I think this is really interesting too, we've partnered with CASEL, which is the uh, uh, helps with uh, many of our uh, employers throughout the region in terms of uh, access to buildings and other types of technology solutions. 
to uh, get a rate of return to work sites uh, for both uh, DC, Richmond, and Baltimore metros, and uh, uh, gauging it against the 10 largest US metros throughout the country in silver here. What you can see is that the DC metro has lagged behind the national level as well as Richmond and Baltimore. And that is because relative to the two other metro areas in our region, uh, it is extremely high uh, relative share for workforce, remote workforce capable jobs. The only region that has a higher share of the workforce that is capable to work remotely is uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco. So uh, we will continue to update this, but I'd say, you know, check back here if you want uh, relevant information. We update it once every two weeks. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and just shift and, and kind of hit, hit where uh, the Greater Washington Partnership and our partners in the Met uh, the Metro Now Coalition are really kind of focusing our attention. Um, we do not believe uh, that we're going to get to a place uh, in January 2022 that we're going to be shutting down stations. Um, and that's because I think the collective region in Maryland, the District of Columbia, the business community, the uh, advocate nonprofit community, the elected officials from both state and federal are working together to make sure that that doesn't happen. I think that with the Biden uh, uh, administration coming in and the Senate uh, changing hands, the, the probability of action on a federal infrastructure uh, bill, whether it be a surface transportation authorization, which is the big uh, bill that we do every couple of years that authorizes various transportation programs on the surface, including transit, or another COVID-related rescue package, as well as a COVID-related infrastructure stimulus package, there's three big bites at the apple. And I think what I would say is that we are confident, and we wanna work with everybody here to make sure that we're speaking with one voice. While the silver line is really important to change outcomes at the federal level, to make sure that we've got both uh, US senators from Virginia working in, in tandem with their partners in Maryland, but also uh, those throughout the country, it takes work to get to 50 plus one, and we've got a task ahead of us to make sure that the votes are there. But I, what I will say is that we, you know, echoing uh, the supervisors, we've got uh, a, a, a set of uh, federal uh, House members and, and senators that are working together on both sides of the aisle to make sure that we're not in a position in January 2022 uh, that we're shutting down stations. Uh, and, and we can't. At the end of the day, that's when folks are coming back to work and our employers are going to require that those stations are open uh, and that we're able to provide service in a safe way. I, I can't get off uh, the soapbox uh, without saying one more thing of, of great importance. Uh, this year uh, of all years is likely the year that we're going to go ahead and get uh, WMATA reauthorized at the federal level. This first happened in 2008. Sometimes it goes as the nickname PREA. Uh, authorization, but uh, that provides us a couple hundred million dollars every year, $150 million every year that's matched by Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia to put the system back to a state of good repair. It's not yet there. We're doing better. The historic funding deal that we got in 2018 was great, but uh, if we lose that $150 million, uh, it's going to be troubling. It's going to be, you know, a, 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 a drop in the bucket, or sorry, a cut that we weren't expecting. So uh, with the surface transportation bill happening this year, we expect that we've got the greatest opportunity to go ahead and attach our WMATA authorization proposal to that bill. Similar to uh, COVID related rescue funds, we expect that we're gonna have great support coordination from the House and the Senate uh, in the federal delegation to prioritize this. Uh, the, the delegation's uh, waiting to introduce the bill and we're encouraging our friends in the House and the Senate to align up those proposals, make sure that they're uh, uh, exactly the same. So we're not um, working against each other, negotiating against each other, rather we're negotiating uh, together, speaking with one voice on both sides of, uh, of the Capitol to, to increase the likelihood of success there. But you know, at the end of the day, that's gonna take another effort uh, collectively with the region, but we're well positioned. You know. Uh, uh, Congressman Hoyer is the uh, majority leader in the House. Uh, Congresswoman Norton is uh, the number two in the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. 
uh, Congressman Jerry Connolly is a senior member on the uh, House Oversight Committee and our senators are working tirelessly on this front. So I, I, I need to make sure that we touch on that one too. We can't lose sight. There's a lot of needs this year, but I, I, what I will say is that this region uh, is working together to make sure that we're staying safe now, that we're keeping our system running, but that we're in position to thrive and grow uh, when we're ready. With that, I'll pause and hand it back to my, my friends. Thank you very much, Joe. And, it, let's, and let's underline again that in 2018, the, the region's win was regional. This, this, was, this was joint action in, you know, across all the jurisdictions. You know, Richmond and, Richmond and Annapolis had to talk to each other. So <laughs> you know, if, we, if, we, if we can get them to do that, surely you know, the the, after that, the rest of it is pretty easy. Um, I'm, I'm gonna hand this over just, so we have now heard a great deal about the big federal picture. Um, and though obviously we are going to work regionally, we are still, we are also going to focus very specifically on as the, one of the two people, Joe, one of the people that Joe mentioned, which is Representative Connolly, along with Representative Wexton and our two senators. And there's also a little bit of the silver line take. So I'm going to hand this over to my boss, Sal Glasner. There is a link in the chat that will tell you know, that when you're, this is all over, we hope you will take action for the silver line and we hope you will click on it. And it will, of course, be available to you afterwards. Sal. Thank you, Anit, uh, and thank you all for allowing me this opportunity. Um, the information that was presented by those who spoke uh, before me um, was really excellent, very detailed, and there really isn't a whole lot that I can add to the fund of knowledge that you just received in terms of just the basic information, both on the capital side, the operational side, some of the implications. What I would like to do um, is give you a certain perspective about this, um, which it's a perspective that I have because of the unique lens that I have as the uh, president and CEO of the Tyson's Partnership. Um, so let me begin by saying that uh, transit is uh, foundational and as existential to the Tyson's that Fairfax uh, County committed to in the comprehensive plan of 2010, and that is uh, as an urban center transit-oriented urban center. It's just what the name implies. If you don't have transit, it can't be transit-oriented. And um, this is not the time and place for me to launch into a, um, uh, a stem winder about uh, all the great things that we've been doing in Tyson's and the future and so forth. But, um, but I do wanna underscore that those four uh, transit station stops that opened in Tyson's, part of the Silver Line, they opened in 2014, um, without, without there having been, if they were never opened, I wouldn't be part of this conversation. Now they're open. If they fail because the operations, uh, the Metro operations on the Silver Line are lackluster, Tyson's is, not, is not, not going to achieve what we all would like for it to achieve. Now, let me open the aperture a little bit more because uh, it would be, um, I would expect some people to say, great, you head up the Tyson's partnership, you look at everything through a Tyson's lens, why do I care? And I'll tell you why, why you care. This is, this is really a regional topic. First of all, think about the Silver Line, which extends from the um, nation, the national capital's um, international gateway airport to the national capital. That's what the Silver Line enables. Now you go around the world and um, every developed country has a direct rail link between its capital and the, and the gateway airport. And we're about to have that as well. It's a little bit late, but we are, we are about to have that. And it's just fundamental to modern economic life and to creating a thriving environment for a capital center that is the focal point for so much that's so important to the country. So let, let's start with that, that this is a connector between Dulles Airport and the nation's capital. And then along the way, you have four station stops in Tyson's. I know there are other station stops as well, and they're all very, very important. But Tyson's uh, today is, and I think will continue to be, um, a major employment center, a major economic driver for this region. It's not about what it does for Tyson's. It's about the fact that you have 
very large scale um, business enterprises that are headquartered in Tyson's as well as numerous smaller businesses. It's all about the fact that Tyson's is the second largest employment center in this region and that is second to Washington DC with about 120,000 employees in based in Tyson's. Yes, I know office is going to change. There's been, there's been a lot of conversation around that, but there's still going to be significance to place and a place that employees can congregate in, even if it's not five days a week. Tyson's is also major a major uh, retail center um, and a huge attraction for the region, which also provides employment to the people who work in those retail centers. The, um, the hospitality industry, the entertainment industry, they're having a hard time now, um, but they will come back. And once again, transit is the lifeblood, not just for the patrons to get there, but also for the workers to get there as well. So the impact, the impact that an employment center like Tyson's has on the entire region is very, very profound. If you start pulling at the bricks that are holding that up, and transit is a central brick, the rest of the structure starts sagging. And so uh, I believe that every citizen of this region has a vested interest in having the Silver Line uh, not only um, eke out an existence, but this having the Silver Line thrive and continue to, to be the, um, the pumping heart of a region-wide uh, economic system. Um, and it's for that reason that it's very, very important that we maintain the advocacy um, both inside our, our delegation, and they've done a tremendous job, but also if there are contacts outside of, that, of our local um, delegation. So for example, many businesses that have significant presence in this region also have significant presence in other parts of the country and there may be access to legislators from those parts of the country who may be significant to this entire conversation. And we shouldn't hesitate to reach out, make the connections that it takes um, in order to be able to advocate for the interest of the national capital region, which is what this is. I'm going to say one more thing, um, and then I think I'll step back and open it up for questions and comments. And that is, so, um, how quickly we forget, uh, we're, we're talking about um, transit and Metro in the context of what we're experiencing today and what we can remember over the last year or two. And of course, right now today, it's tough. A 80, 90% reduction in ridership, that is, that's just staggering. Um, we will, uh, Tyson's partnership is going to participate in a major back to Metro campaign when the time is right for that in order to encourage people to recognize that it's safe, uh, it's accessible, and it needs to be used. But if you're standing on a, on, a, on a platform and waiting 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes for a train and then have to connect somewhere else and you're going to wait another 15, 20, 25 minutes for a train, you're, not, you're just not going to stand on the platform. It's that simple. And let's not forget that in 2015, Metro Rail was open until 3 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. Sunday service began at 7 a.m., not at eight o'clock. Some rush hour trains ran every three minutes. That's the way a train system is supposed to work if you want to encourage people to use it. And if it doesn't work that way, if you have these long headways, if it shuts down at nine or 10 o'clock at night, if it doesn't open on the weekends, it just, it's like a muscle, it atrophies, it just shrivels up, people don't use it. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh yeah, nobody rides Metro, why should we invest in it? Well, yes, nobody rides a Metro that is simply not accessible and not doing the job that it needs to be done. So what we have to advocate for is a robust transit system that moves people when people need to be moved, not when the system is ready to wake up and do it. Um, so I will get off of that soapbox because I could go on for a while. Um, Roni did mention that I'm an enthusiastic 
um, user of Metro. That that comes from my days uh, growing up in New York City, and we could get into that some other time. But um, I do think that this is something that is important to all citizens of the National Capital Region to advocate for and to support. Again, thank you for the opportunity, much appreciated. Thank you very much. And we're now turning this over to Joe Ritchie. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, extremely in informative, uh, but also at the same time, uh, inviting uh, lots of thoughts about what else we'd like to know. And I've been receiving some uh, input through the Q&A and through uh, text messages that have been coming to me. And I'd like to ask uh, a couple questions related to what uh, the, the audience today is interested in. One of those topics is what specific stations might be at risk in Tyson's and the Western portion of the Silver Line? And um, I'm not sure who would be best to answer that. I think it was partially addressed. Uh, would uh, Supervisor Laterno or Alcorn uh, be willing to answer that or would someone else? Yeah, um, as it relates to phase two, actually most of them, um, except for the end of the line station. So I guess, you know, there's there were 22 stations identified that could be shut down as part of the January budget reconciliation. Um, I think I would encourage folks to not necessarily get completely caught up in that and that list, because as I said, if we believe that that's truly what's going to happen and that there's not going to be any additional federal funding, I'm not so sure the board would go in that route and put us in a position of having to shut down those stations. Um, I think it's good to advocate that we not do that, but you know, I, I don't know that that's so much the realistic piece. We can, it is public, which stations would be part of that shut down and we can follow up and, and get that full list to everybody that's interested though. Thank you. Supervisor Alcorn, would you like to add your comments there as well, please? No, I think Matt's, Matt's more uh, up to speed on that and I, I agree with what Matt said. And by the way, let me thank uh, both Supervisor Letourneau and Supervisor Alcorn for their uh, pro proactive approach to trying to take care of the silver line and uh, get the funding we need. And along those lines, what can the businesses that are representative on, represented on this call today, the uh, nonprofit organizations that are on this call today, and most importantly, the individuals that are on this call today, what can they do who should they contact to advocate for the federal dollars we need to stave off this uh, potentially catastrophic uh, event heading our way with the uh, non-opening of Metro Silver Line? So um, what I would say is a couple things. Um, I think the, the, the takeaway, hopefully, from this meeting, and I think the message as it relates particularly to phase two is... Metro should open phase two when it's ready to be open. You know, there should not be an artificial delay to that due to budgetary reasons. And I think that message is perfect for the Metro budget process and the, and the, uh, the input sessions that we're going to have. There will be lots of folks that advocate for particular pieces of the Metro pie. We always see that on the board, but I think um, typically this uh, you know, this community in Virginia, the rail community isn't always as active in that. I think this would be a year to, to you know, make your voice heard in that metro process and make sure that the rest of the board knows how important this is. In terms of the federal piece, obviously metro itself is doing a lot of direct advocacy and has its own lobby shop that, that does those things. Um, I thought Saul's suggestion was, was great in terms of a lot of companies that have a presence here in Northern Virginia also have a presence elsewhere, you know, ultimately we don't have to convince our delegation. We have to convince the folks who represent areas that don't have this transit constituency, right? So if you're, you know, you're a Senator from West Virginia, Senator Manchin, um, you know, is, is this your, is this your, because I think he's going to be the one who, who helps, helps decide a lot of these things, right? Um, is he going to be, you know, particularly attuned to what the needs are for the transit, you know, the urban areas that have transit? If you think about it, there's only really a handful of really large transit systems that are impacted in this way, and they typically exist in major urban areas. And as much as we like to say these things are bipartisan, the representation is not terribly bipartisan 
from those places at this particular juncture in our political moment. So, um, you know, I, I, one of my pieces I bring to this is I am from the other party and I do advocate for transits, which isn't, isn't always that common. But anyway, uh, but I think that that's a smart way to approach this, you know, uh, it, it, through the federal and, and GR operations, you know, this should be something that some of those companies can advocate for, including to their members who are from other places and, and make sure that they know it's a priority. Uh, Keith Merlin has weighed in with a couple questions. Um, and he's talking about with ridership being down, uh, you know, clearly that impacts the operation of the Silver Line. Uh, what, what do you think that means for uh, service uh, to uh, Dulles Rail at Dulles? So um, I think it's an operational question for Metro once service starts, but um, I would anticipate that, that uh, Dulles would receive the same type of service as the rest of the system. Um, you know, one of the things that we do look for is, uh, you know, equity in terms of the, the level of service we receive. In the current Metro system, the red line does receive more frequent service because it really is the main sort of spine corridor route that goes through the district and it has the highest ridership. And even from the standpoint of ensuring social distancing and such that, you know, it does receive a little bit more service. But for the most part, the rest of the system has the same headways between trains and things like that. And I think, you know, one of the things that we'll be fighting for um, on the Metro board is ensuring that the Silver Line, all of it, receives that same level of service and it needs to be good service. Another uh, comment from Kerry Wilson uh, talking about how critical Northern Virginia and I would even add myself, the Silver Line corridor, corridor is to uh, the economic growth and strength of the DMV region. Uh, how, do you think that the rest of, and I'm, let me direct this to Joe McAndrew. Joe, do you think that the rest of the Washington metropolitan area understands the uh, financial strength uh, and economic growth potential uh, that exists in the Silver Line corridor. And let me just add a, a couple facts. The Silver Line corridor has 70, in excess of 70 million square feet of office space today. That's more than downtown San Francisco. We have 35 million square feet of growth projected over the next two plus decades. Uh, an extraordinary number considering that base. And uh, we're continuing to see that growth, even with, if you take a look at uh, uh, Cap One, at the borough, at Reston Station, and certainly at Reston Town Center, which uh, Boston Properties has done an amazing jo job uh, this year. They've leased around a million and a half square feet of net new absorption. Uh, incredible, that probably equals the rest of the Washington metropolitan area combined in net absorption. I mean, it's just incredible what's happened there. And I'm not sure that the rest of the region really understands uh, that. And I, I haven't even mentioned uh, in, in uh, Supervisor Latorno, uh, Latorno's uh, uh, neighborhood, the 26 not to mention the office space, but the 26 million square feet of data center space, multiples of any other major data center space located anywhere else in the world. We're, we are the center of the cloud. Do you think the rest of the Washington metropolitan area understands the vitality that's happening here? Maybe they don't understand it as finally as what you just articulated, but I, I would argue that they understand it and, and they would be uh, willing for you to lend some of that to their jurisdiction. Uh, but they're also, <laughs> they also understand the need of being able to get um, their residents to jobs in the areas that you're, you're discussing, right? In terms of connecting folks to jobs and opportunity, the employers in the Silver Line corridor need talent to be able to access those destinations uh, some of them might not be able to live adjacent to those jobs uh, for, for various uh, familial reasons. But I, I, I think, you know, one area that you can see that there's a level of understanding and appreciation outside of transit, right? I'm a transit rider. I prefer to come on the Silver Line when I come, come see my friends there, um, DC resident here, sorry. Uh, 
but but the politics are changing in terms of regional coordination and connectivity. Look at um, the American Legion Bridge. You know, how many years have we worked to try to get that project to a place where it is today? And a lot of it is just the demand and the traffic to be able to get across that bridge from one direction to the other uh, and home again in a reliable fashion. So I think the, the region understands it's the question of how we ultimately uh, make sure that we uh, can make those investments here uh, and support the larger region as well. And I think, I think, and I'm fairly confident, um, uh, echoing uh, Supervisor Laterna, that the region is going to come on, on uh, in support of, of uh, bringing the silver line on uh, as soon as it's ready, as soon as it's safely uh, ready for WMATA to take it on and, and to and to operate and function. And it's too important. It's too large, and and it's uh, for all the uh, square footage of space that you just articulated, uh, it's it's needed now. Um, Joe, uh, Joe, can I jump in? Uh, yeah, please. There's, there's one thing I, I just want to uh, also suggest. Um, I think it would be very helpful for people who work for companies uh, along in organizations along the Silver Line uh, to communicate with Metro specifically uh, how many employees that they plan to have come back and when, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of office space that's not being used right now that is that will be used in the coming months. Um, and I think the timing of that and the numbers and sharing that with Metro is gonna be one of the, the sources of real data uh, that, that Metro is not gonna have otherwise. Um, you know, that's one of the challenges I think uh, we face from Virginia in educating our colleagues on the Metro board and, and otherwise that, that you can't just look at what the federal government is doing in terms of GSA return to office. Um, that's not the calculation in the silver line, you know, between <laughs> in Tyson's, you know, cap one and MITRE and, and SAIC and, and the mall and, and then, you know, Fannie Mae coming and, and, and Reston and, you know, AWS. I mean, you have, this is like a totally different calculation. And I think there is some education that has to go on. And, and as folks can per, pull that information, that data together and share it, please do so. Well, I personally will uh, try and have the organizations that I touch uh, help address that issue. And as you know, everybody's trying to figure that out right now. <laughs> but uh, as fast as we can help with that, uh, Supervisor Alcorn, we will do our very best to do that. Uh, I think the Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce will certainly take that on and I'm sure other chambers, Tyson's Partnership and other organizations will uh, do the same. Well, we're at 520. I think uh, we've had a very successful uh, Q&A here. Uh, and let me turn this back over to Georgia. Great, uh, Georgia, is it you or do I turn it to Joe? Um, well, I'd like to just uh, ask uh, Ronit if she has any final comments. She did such a superior job of moderating. I'm so impressed. Thank you, Ronit. Do you want to say anything before we uh, close out? Uh, thank you. I'm very flattered. Um, I have nothing to add to the amazing panelists and qu questions and answers that you've all heard. I will merely say once again that if you go to the chat, there is a link there that will tell you know, that will take you to an, a page that gives you the phone numbers and emails of your congressional delegation. Um, these are the people who work for you. They need to hear what's on your mind, and they need to know about the you know. If I'm sure that they have all been working very hard, you could just call them up and say thank you. I represent you know this part of the Silver Line corridor, and our economic recovery is on the line. And hope, let's work together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Thank you very much. I would also uh, like to thank all the speakers for this incredible presentation. And I certainly hope all that are participating will take the call to action and really support our Dulles Quarter. Many thanks for co-sponsoring Tyson's partnership. We're very grateful. Annual premier sponsor, Transwestern. The chamber sponsors, Eldon Street Financial, Main Street Bank, Northwestern Federal Credit Union, Thompson Greenspan, and uh, Channel 10 as our media coverage sponsor. And of course, our many wonderful Silver Line Committee members. Thank you all. And I'll turn it over to our interim president, Joe Martin. Thank you. Great, thank you, Georgia. And thank you panelists uh, so much and Renee for uh, 
for facilitating this uh, excellent information. And I tell you, um, there's you don't realize what you have until it's gone. And even though growing up in, in Manassas, I didn't have a lot of reasons to use Metro, but when I needed it, I was so glad it was there. And I'll give you two quick examples of that. One or two times, uh, three years ago when our Washington Capitals won the Stanley Cup. And then two years ago when our Washington Nationals won the World Series, I was able to take the VRE out of Manassas to Union Station, hop on the Metro, take it to L'Enfant Plaza Station, two blocks from the celebration. And if Metro's not there, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I had to drive and deal with that parking. The other situation I was thinking of, I uh, used to travel a lot with a company I worked for for 10 years and I was at Dulles Airport and I, uh, they messed up the air flight and actually had booked me through uh, Reagan National. So I had to hop back in my car and boogie down the toll road and risk getting a speeding ticket and all that kind of fun stuff to get to Nashville. It had been nice to just to throw my luggage on the Metro and tool all the way from Dulles Airport to Reagan National. So, so for those of us that just use it uh, sparingly, uh, it, it's important to all of us. So, so again, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for being part of this wonderful community. And thank you most of all being part of this, of your Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce. Have a great evening. Hi, I'm Joe Fay. We're out here setting up for uh, Hot Meals Meals Distribution. Uh, we do this every night, 365 days a year. It's getting a lot more interesting and a lot tougher, but the need's the same and in fact growing. Last March, as COVID-19 swept into our community, there was never any question that facets would remain on the front lines to serve our neighbors. People's lives were depending on us. In 1988, Linda Wimpy met a homeless family in need of food. One warm meal turned into hot meals every night and Facets was born. Over the years, Facets' role in Fairfax County has grown dramatically, but the mission remains the same, a community working together to alleviate the suffering caused by homelessness, poverty, and hunger. These are challenging times for us all, but especially for our most vulnerable and marginalized neighbors. Since March, Facets has had to adapt fast to our changing reality, and you've stood beside us every step of the way to meet the greatest needs of our community. As people worried about their next meal and how to put food on their tables, we increased Hot Meals distributions and expanded our food assistance to include grocery deliveries and weekly community-based mass food distributions. We're out distributing food this morning. Hi, I'm Jerry Caruso. I'm helping out tonight. We just fed hundreds of people and appreciate everything that everyone is doing for Facets. I'm really grateful for all of the uh, volunteers that come out to help us. For well, we serve over thousands uh, of, of people uh, when they provide us the food to serve it. With our homeless and unstably housed neighbors facing considerable risk during this crisis, we were able to increase our outreach activities and expand our work to manage an isolation and quarantine shelter. Here at our site, we make sure that our guests have three full meals a day, plus snacks, they have clothing that is purchased new or gently used and donated from our community partners. Also, our guests, they feel safe here. They feel warm, they're out of the elements, and they are safe and secure here at our site. We are so happy when they let us know that they have found a job or permanent housing or learned how to do something new. It's so encouraging to us. It's just as encouraging to us as it is to them. And again, I am so proud to be a part of a team like this. So happy to see the results and so thankful for you and all that you've done to partner with us and make this possible. Often you hear that families are just one paycheck away from being homeless. For the people Facets serves, it can be one circumstance, a loss of a job, an illness, a car repair, or any unexpected expense. During this crisis, as families struggle to keep roofs over their heads, we have been here with financial assistance to prevent evictions, keep utilities on, 
and pay medical bills. We are so happy that we are able to lend a helping hand during this time. As students and their families face significant struggles and worries about virtual learning and meeting basic needs, FACETS is there ensuring that they receive the support, supplies, and tools they need. Through the support from our community and everyone working together, we can ensure that the most basic needs of all families are met and that our children have the support for virtual learning during our daily homework help program and that they have the supplies they need in order to succeed and to break the cycle of poverty. From all of us on the ECD team, thank you for caring and thank you for your dedicated support. Every day of the week, FACET's program staff are out in the community delivering food, cleaning supplies, and PPE as they provide case management and make connections to life-changing resources. And, as temperatures drop, the doors to our hypothermia shelter remain open 24 hours a day. This season at hypothermia, we're doing things differently. We are, we're here 24 hours a day to make sure that none of our neighbors have to sleep outside during the cold winter months. When someone comes to hypo, we try to make the situation as comfortable as possible for them understanding that they are coming in from being homeless, from living in cars, tents, and the woods. It can be really emotional. We know that we may be meeting some of our guests at the worst moments of their lives, so we are here with a warm, safe place to sleep, meals provided by our amazing faith partners and case management to help them connect with resources on their journey to stability. Thank you so much for providing the donations and support we need to operate Hypo this season. What you're doing is amazing and it's really helpful for all of our guests that, that stay at Hypo this year. One of FACETS' greatest strengths has been the ability to convene the community to rush to the assistance of those experiencing hardships. It is people from all backgrounds joining together to meet the critical needs among us. It is at these times that you find out just how much more you can do than you thought you could. That is the magic of community. Thank you to our community for helping our neighbors experiencing homelessness, poverty, and hunger. We couldn't do this without you. During these times of challenges and uncertainty, it means so much to know that you are all there for the children, families, and individuals who are struggling and need our help. You are bringing so much promise, relief, and hope. From all of us at FACETS, thank you.